Since the late 1980s, the Final Fantasy series has blossomed from being a simple line of sequential games into one of the most famous and extensive multimedia franchises on the planet. This wouldn't have been possible without plenty of risk and innovation. But while some of these risks have paid off, serving to elevate the franchise onto a whole new level, others have not. In more recent times, the spotlight in this regard has been hyper-focused on mobile games. When companies make it big in this space, they really make it big. As of May 2023, it's estimated that Dragon Quest Walk has generated over $1.7 billion in revenue since its launch back in 2019. And even the much derided Final Fantasy XV A New Empire ended up generating over half a billion dollars, making it one of the most successful mobile games ever produced. The problem is that for all these successes, there's also a lot of collateral damage. Games are churned out using a scattergun approach with the hopes that one of them can become that next smash hit. But whether it's due to a project's inability to meet certain expectations through mechanical performance or structural issues, or just a plain lack of viability, many of these games fail to live up to expectations and face a premature end. With regards to Square Enix, such is their track record of cancelling mobile games that passing the 12 month milestone is now regarded as a pretty significant rite of passage. But with that in mind, for today's video, we've decided to explore some of the games that didn't even make it that far. So strap yourselves in as we delve into seven Final Fantasy games that faced unfortunate closure within 12 months of their release, with the caveat here being that the cancellation announcement itself happened within 12 months, not necessarily that the game was removed from circulation during that time. And what better place to start than with one of the most recent examples, Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier. After laying dormant for years, the compilation of Final Fantasy VII was jolted into life upon the announcement and subsequent release of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. It would take some time for this to manifest, but Yoshinori Kitaze had hinted, towards the start of 2017, that the next phase of the compilation would be influenced by the Final Fantasy XV universe. Kitaze even shared that this meant numerous mobile games were being planned as a way of sustaining interest between the launch of each part and as a way of generating additional revenue. At the end of 2021, Square Enix revealed that two original mobile games were in production. The first, called Ever Crisis, would be a recreation of the original game and surrounding compilation. It would be released in episodic format and would be an atypical gacha game. The second game, however, would be quite different. Dubbed Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, it would delve into one of the more intriguing narrative elements from the original game, Soldier. And this made sense, but what didn't make sense was the genre, as The First Soldier would be a mobile exclusive third-person shooter battle royale game. Based on this, there was quite a lot of apprehension ahead of launch as it didn't seem like there was any kind of logical crossover between Final Fantasy, Square Enix, or the Battle Royale genre. This apprehension was then further fueled by Tetsuya Nomura, who, despite conceiving the game, revealed that he had little to no interest in the Battle Royale genre and had never even played one. The developer chosen by Square Enix as their partner, A-Team, had also never worked on a Battle Royale game before, but then again, according to their marketing materials, neither had any other developer in Japan. Nonetheless, when the closed beta test wrapped up, the feedback was positive. A-Team promised to address some of the more pressing concerns and they spent a lot of time and money on influencer marketing to drum up hype. This saw the likes of Alex Mukala and Yuna Leska gifted an awesome personalised package. And A-Team even pushed this outside the Final Fantasy specific influencers, going after big Twitch streamers like Lindsay Elise and Swiftor. A-Team also created an ambassador program which promised in-game perks for consistent content creation and this led to a huge volume of pre-registrations. Everything signalled that Square Enix had pulled one out of the bag and subverted expectations. But not too long after launch, the cracks started to show. The player base dropped like flies and even though the developer tried numerous tactics to try and boost engagement, nothing seemed to work. Many of the initial ambassadors stopped supporting the game, citing a multitude of issues, and even though new ambassadors were appointed, this did little to stop the player base from hemorrhaging. The financial strain placed on A-Team also started to show, 
as after posting an operating loss of $1.1 million in Q1 of 2022, they went on to post an operating loss of $5 million in the following quarter. These losses showed, in the clearest of terms, that the first soldier was not performing on any level. And less than a year after its launch, Square Enix and A-Team announced that the first soldier would cease operations. The game's non-English speaking versions closed down three weeks later, with the English speaking version kept alive until January 2023. But even though the first soldier would serve as an unfortunate stain on the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, Square Enix sought to keep its memory alive through its sister title, Ever Crisis, as Glenn, Matt and Lucia returned as protagonists and were even given their own storyline. The First Soldier has served as one of the more extreme mobile games produced by Square Enix, but the way in which the more traditional games have been brought to market has also changed over time. In the past, these games were often used to tell side stories as a way of fulfilling Yuichi Wada's desire to create polymorphic content. But after working on many of these types of games, Takashi Tokita dreamt of creating an original game that would go beyond what people had grown to expect from mobile role-playing experiences. The idea was to break stereotypes, and move away from what was often perceived as cheap that were only meant to provide a momentary distraction as opposed to something more concrete. This desire brought about the creation of Final Fantasy Legends, a game that would act as a successor to the numerous Final Fantasy games produced during the 16-bit era. It would therefore adopt a job system, and numerous classic elements would return, but it would also feature an original cast of characters and a rich narrative. That narrative ended up being over 50 hours in length, and when combined with its detailed gameplay system, Final Fantasy Legends was unlike anything else on the market. The success of Legends saw Square Enix do something quite unprecedented, greenlight the production of a successor. But instead of producing a simple iteration that would enhance mechanics and play things safe, Tokida decided to create a wholly different experience that would have a brand new cast of characters be set in a new world and feature very different gameplay mechanics. At its core, Final Fantasy Legends Crystal of Space Time would be based on concepts from the abandoned Chrono Break. Immense gameplay would have no resemblance to the ATB system used in the original game and a conditional turn-based system was developed instead. The extensive job system was also removed, replaced with a system that was more similar to Final Fantasy VI, as characters could learn abilities by equipping signets from specific Eidolons. This all represented a pretty big departure, but there were also changes with the delivery method. Whereas Legends was a paid-for episodic game, its sequel was initially designed and distributed as a free-to-play game with monetization fueled by gacha mechanics. Final Fantasy Legends Crystal of Spacetime launched on the 12th of February 2015 as a Japanese exclusive game. 18 months later, in November 2016 though, it was announced that the game would be re-released as Final Fantasy Legends 2. Many elements were overhauled for the re-release, but players could still play through the story from where they last stopped and replay older chapters while enjoying the new updates. This was all meant to be a true representation of how Final Fantasy Legends Crystal of Spacetime had been envisioned from the beginning, but Square Enix decided to pull the plug just 10 months later. However, even though the free-to-play version of Final Fantasy Legends 2 was cancelled, it would live on as a standalone premium version. This would be released a week after service was terminated, and it was this version that would be made available for English speakers as Final Fantasy Dimensions 2. Final Fantasy XV featured a development and pre-release promotional phase that was unlike anything seen before, Final Fantasy or otherwise. It included huge events, tons of different multimedia properties and various collaborations with real-world elements, and this even extended through to the in-game universe. Noctis and his companions would often be seen playing games during their moments of rest, and one of these games was called King's Knight, which was supposedly quite popular amongst the residents of Aeos. In the initial sense, the game being called King's Knight was a fun easter egg. King's Knight was of course released by Square back in 1986 on the Famicom, and it was directed by Hironobu Sakaguchi. Even though it was essentially a side-scrolling shooter, it was dubbed as a formation RPG by the marketing team as a way of separating it out from the deluge of other side-scrolling shooters that were being released around the same time. This was all quite fun and novel, but things took an interesting turn when it was announced that King's Knight was being remade as King's Knight Wrath of the Dark Dragon, and that it was planned to release on iOS and Android devices. 
At this point, there was a decent amount of intrigue, as people did genuinely want to play the same game that Noctis was playing in-game, but King's Knight would suffer numerous issues throughout development. The initial plan was for the game to be released at the back end of 2016 so that people could experience it alongside Final Fantasy XV. With the game announced during the Tokyo Game Show, this seemed like a realistic goal. But as the end of the year approached, nothing was heard. That was until the 27th of December, when it was announced that King's Knight had been delayed until 2017. Two months later, it was revealed that the game's soft launch, which had initially taken place in Australia at the end of 2016, had not gone to plan. It would therefore be undergoing a large-scale renewal update to ensure it would meet expectations upon launch. King's Knight would end up launching on the 13th of September 2017, and with so much time having passed since the initial launch of Final Fantasy XV, King's Knight needed to be able to survive on its own. But even though the game had essentially been redeveloped, it still faced criticism for its clunky gameplay, general lack of quality, inconvenient load times, and its predatory in-app purchase system. Only six months later, Square Enix announced that they would be shutting the game down, and its service ended on the 26th of June 2018. Now what happened to King's Knight was pretty rough, but it had already been foreshadowed by a game called Justice Monsters 5. Justice Monsters 5 was a popular arcade pinball machine that could be found throughout EOS in the Crow's Nest fast food establishments as well as the cafe in Altissia. And it wasn't that bad as a minigame due to the integration of numerous elements from other games like pachinko, gadget collecting, fighting and arcade shoot 'em ups Similar to King's Knight, when it was announced that an actual version of Justice Monsters 5 was being created for iOS and Android devices, and it was also being planned for Windows 10, people were pretty excited, because it was a fun piece of pre-release marketing. But less than two months after the announcement, Hajime Tabata revealed that Justice Monsters 5 would be delayed. More news was promised at E3 alongside a release date, but E3 came and went, and nothing was said. A few weeks after E3, the developers announced via Twitter that they were aiming to release the game at the end of August 2016, and it did end up launching on the 30th of August. However, even though Justice Monsters 5 was presented as a pinball game, the mechanics were far too convoluted, and its heavy reliance on random number generation for victory and bonus points hindered enjoyment. These issues, alongside a lack of any real reason to keep on playing, meant Justice Monsters 5 failed to build any kind of audience. And just four months after launch, and only one month after the launch of Final Fantasy XV, it was announced that the game would be shut down. As such, Justice Monsters 5 would disappear from the mobile scene on the 27th of March 2017, and the promised Windows 10 version never saw the light of day. As the Final Fantasy franchise approached its 10th anniversary, Square decided to start taking the creation of spin-off titles more seriously, and alongside Final Fantasy Tactics, this saw the creation of numerous Chocobo-based games. One of the more popular was Chocobo Racing, and for the 35th anniversary, Square Enix decided to try and revive this franchise through a brand new game called Chocobo GP. Like its predecessor, Chocobo GP would serve as a kart racing game that featured numerous tributes. Its character roster would feature the likes of Chocobos and Moogles, but also characters like Vivi, Cloud, and even Maduin from Final Fantasy VI. On the surface, everything seemed great, with Chocobo GP promising a fun and nostalgic kart racing experience. But when the game launched on the 10th of March 2022, the response was mixed. While there was an appreciation for the gameplay and presentation, there was genuine surprise about the game's monetization model. Despite being a standalone, paid-for game, Chocobo GP also featured an abundance of microtransactions, frequent ad presentations, an in-game paid currency system called Mithril, and the profuse parading of season passes. Some content was also gatekept through these systems, meaning if consumers didn't pay, they could never be unlocked. It turned Chocobo GP from being a nostalgic celebration to a money-grabbing gimmick, and consumers and media outlets were not shy with voicing their disapproval. Square Enix attempted to justify their actions, but would end up making wholesale changes to how the monetization worked. They would continue to tinker with this as the year progressed, but on the 21st of December 2022, less than 12 months after launch, the developers announced that they would not only be abandoning the monetization system, but that they had cancelled all planned large-scale updates for the game and would effectively no longer be supporting it. Midway through 2023, Jogbo GP was then re-released as a brand new game. 
This new version was more in line with what fans expected from the game in the first place. It featured no monetization mechanics and all unlockable items were made available through in-game progression from the outset. Now one of the more interesting Final Fantasy spin-offs from the last 10 years has to be Final Fantasy Explorers. It arrived on the Nintendo 3DS towards the end of 2014 in Japan, and although it wasn't quite as extensive or methodical as something being produced in association with Monster Hunter, it still scratched the itch for some. Keen to build out the sub-franchise, Square Enix greenlit a follow-up that was called Final Fantasy Explorers Force. It was directed by Takahiro Abe, the production manager of the original game. But unlike the original game, Explorers Force was planned for mobile devices as opposed to consoles. Ahead of the game's launch, pre-orders were in the hundreds of thousands, and with the game featuring high quality graphics, rich gameplay, and a much smoother multiplayer experience than the 3DS version, expectations were quite high. Unfortunately, those expectations were stunted by the monetization being far too aggressive. Within this particular subgenre, players expect to grind for the best gear, it's part of the fun, but Explorers Force made the unfortunate choice of locking the best gear behind paywalls. Enemies would still drop, but the drop rates were made ridiculously low on purpose so as to push players towards spending money. Whereas this type of mechanic was prevalent within other gacha games and very successful, for this particular game it left a bitter taste for those who enjoyed Explorers and other similar games. And as the player base got frustrated and left, and less and less revenue was being generated, the developers were forced to decrease the scale and frequency of updates. The end result will be the game's closure on the 19th of February 2019, less than a year after it had launched, and its poor performance seemed to serve as a death knell for the Explorer sub-franchise. That then brings us on to our last game, which has a similar parallel with the previous game we featured, and that game is World of Final Fantasy Melly Mello. World of Final Fantasy launched just before Final Fantasy XV, and it not only contained an extensive list of nods to almost the entire franchise, but also a compelling original story and an innovative twist on the traditional ATB system. Such was the quality of the game that World of Final Fantasy ended up selling a load of copies. And to try and capitalize, Square Enix started working on two new initiatives. One called World of Final Fantasy Maxima, which would serve as an expansion to the original game, adding a whole load of new content, while the other, called World of Final Fantasy Melly Mello, would be a mobile game set in the same world. The curious element here though, was that Melly Mello was actually conceived before World of Final Fantasy, but the team decided to reverse their launch plan so that they could reuse assets and make the development of the smartphone version much more streamlined and cost effective. Melly Mello would launch almost a year after World of Final Fantasy, and it will be released on iOS and Android devices. But like many other mobile games released during this time, Melly Mello would have a heavy emphasis on gacha mechanics to generate revenue. Unfortunately, players were antagonized by the gacha mechanics being associated with upgrading and the acquisition of the strongest mirages. This then created a very strong pay to win vibe, and the rest of the game was not strong enough to overcome these challenges. Less than a year after launch, even though the console version of World of Final Fantasy was beloved by many, Square Enix announced that Melly Mello would be terminated. And similar to Final Fantasy Explorers, such was the nature of Melly Mello's demise, the future of the World of Final Fantasy subgenre has been left in limbo. And with that, they were seven Final Fantasy games that were cancelled in 12 months or less. Did you have the chance to experience any of these games before they were cancelled? If so, let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe for more content. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Adam Aguilara, Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Galsin Dikujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.